How well do CrossFitters do after rotator cuff repair? First and foremost, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for your support. You truly allow me to do what I love for a living. My name is Dan Pope. I'm a physical therapist, coach, personal trainer, and I am a meathead. This is the Fitness Pain-Free Show, where we help coaches and physical therapists like you get your patients out of pain and back to training. If you're watching on YouTube, please hit that like button. Give me a comment and subscribe to the channel. If you're listening via podcast, please give me a positive rating and review. It helps me a ton. If you want to go that extra step and support the channel further, support me further, consider subscribing to Fitness Pain-Free Insiders. It's a comprehensive educational resource and toolkit for the fitness and rehab professionals. Think Netflix, but for trainers and physical therapists. A lot of folks who watch my content will ask, you know, how can I continue learning from you? Uh, I want to try to figure out your system. Well, this is like a no-brainer first step in order to do that, all right? So Insiders is kind of like Netflix, but for trainers and physical therapists. It's premium content all from me. I've been updating this monthly for the past five or so years. It's not really a hodgepodge of webinars. It really is a comprehensive continuing education program, all right? About as cheap as you can get. Uh, it's got over 100 webinars, ebooks, and complete guides. You'll have access to a private Facebook group to ask any questions. I'll answer them. You can decide upcoming podcast topics. Best of all, it's only $1 to get started for a week trial. After that, it's just $12.99 per month, and you can cancel at any time. Now, I'll put a link in the show notes where you guys can check this out. Uh, otherwise, all you need to do is go to fitnesspainfree.com, click on the programs link, and then click on Fitness Pain Free Insiders Online Library to get started. Uh, the article we're going over today is called High Rate of Return to CrossFit Training After Arthroscopic Management of Rotator Cuff Tears by Carbone et al. in the Orthopedic Journal of Sports Medicine, April 2020. This one is also open access, so make sure you check it out if you want some more information. So why? Why are we looking at this paper today? Uh, I think it's super important that we have some expectations that we can talk to our patients about. Um, so if I have a rotator cuff tear and I'm thinking about surgery, I really want to know what this surgery is going to do for me, right? Am I going to be able to return to my sport, my activity? Am I going to be able to snatch? Am I going to be able to clean and jerk? How long is this going to take me? And am I going to be able to get back to the same level that I was at prior to surgery? These are important to me. Is this surgery just for pain? Um, how often do these surgeries uh, re-tear, right? If I'm going back to something like snatch and clean and jerk, I want to make sure I don't tear my rotator cuff again. And at the end of the day, the patient wants to know the best option, and they're coming to you for that advice. So it's important for us to actually have some information about how we can counsel these folks, right? Should I say, hey, do physical therapy, or no, do surgery because the outcomes are great. Does paper help with that? So what was awesome about this study, it was very specific to the population that I see and we love and we work with on a regular basis, which is fitness. And it's very high level fitness. And as we'll get into, um, it's very competitive fitness as well. Most studies on the rotator cuff are done in the general population, They're done with older folks. And not that there's a problem with that, but it doesn't really give us great feedback about whether or not my, my fit athletic person is going to be able to get back to snatching or clean and jerk right? Uh, in this study, that is exactly what these athletes were going to get back to. So good information. The other piece is that I want to know more information about rehabilitation. Um, if the outcomes were good, which, you know, they were, um, what did they do to get back? You know, we can learn a little bit about uh, the rehab protocol. Maybe they have something in there that really helped, um, can help us out, help our athletes get back and uh, maybe tells us a little bit about what needs to be done in order to have those good outcomes, right? So a um, little introduction, um, injuries happen in fitness, all right? Um, and this is, you know, I'm not going to get too far into these injury stats, but CrossFit injury rates are very similar to other forms of fitness. So Olympic weightlifting, gym training, distance running, military conditioning, and gymnastics. Uh, and to be honest, there are relatively high rates in distance running, military conditioning, and gymnastics, um, higher than other things like bodybuilding or golf. So I'm not going to sit here and tell you that the rates of injury in CrossFit are you know, tiny and minuscule, they're actually a bit higher than other forms of fitness, which is okay, right? Uh, but the injury rates are definitely lower than contact sports like soccer or basketball. The other piece is that if you're more competitive, and we see this all over the place, not just in CrossFit, um, there's going to be a little bit more risk, right? And the other piece is if you're going to be very, very competitive, there's more time requirement, they're just going to have more exposure and your risk of injury is going to go up, all right? So that's important to understand. 
So the other thing that we're seeing with CrossFit is that there's a higher rate of shoulder injury than other body parts. And there's only been one study so far that's looked at that as far as I know. But if you look at the other studies that are done in the CrossFit population, the shoulder, the low back, and the knee um, are ranking among the top most injured areas, right? That makes sense. CrossFit's very shoulder intensive. You're looking at uh, dynamic gymnastics movements like muscle ups, like kipping. Um, you're looking at certain, or excuse me, um, Olympic weightlifting. So you're looking at the snatch, the clean and jerk. And if and from a gymnastics and Olympic weightlifting perspective, if you look at those sports and the rates of injury, the shoulder is up there, right? So if similar movements used, of course, it makes sense. So from time to time, you will see some rotator cuff tears. Is surgery a viable option to return back to CrossFit? Is it one of those things where I can repair the cuff and actually get back to CrossFit, not just, you know, get back to my life and get out of pain? So the authors of this paper hypothesize yes. So what were the methods? So they took athletes regularly participating in CrossFit, um, and they were doing a lot of CrossFit, and you had to do at least four or more days of training per week. And the average person was doing 15 hours of training, plus or minus three hours every week. So if they're training five days a week, that's three hours per day. Uh, so it's quite a bit, and that's going to be more than the average weekend warrior. It's more than the average person that goes from a recreational perspective and trains in the gym three to five times per week. This is above and beyond that, okay? So I do think they captured a competitive athlete. Maybe not as high as the top regional or games level athletes, but they, they definitely captured a competitive um, population. These folks had to train for minimum of one uh, year. Uh, the average age was 40 plus or minus eight years or so. The youngest person was 29. The oldest person was 52. Uh, do keep in mind that most rotator cuff injuries occur as we age. So this is a bit of a younger population to have a cuff injury. Uh, these folks were not allowed to have a prior injury at the shoulder or the neck. And their pre-surgery participation, uh, the baseline um, was 45% of those folks before the surgery were trained at the same amount they normally do. Um, the 50%, so half, about half people were maintaining their baseline in terms of how often they were training. And the other half had to scale back a little bit. And then just one person in the study actually had to stop CrossFit in general. Um, this is pretty consistent with most CrossFitters that I see. Even if you have a, a, an injury as a CrossFitter, you're probably going to continue to train in some capacity. It doesn't mean you're going to stop. So, you know, this wasn't very uh, weird to me. Most of these folks are going to continue training. And I bet you if these folks didn't get surgery, they'd probably train a similar amount. So... The other thing that was interesting to note is that there was a maximum of six months from injury to surgery. Um, so basically, the majority of these injuries were probably acute in nature, uh, or you had a chronic injury that just kind of, you know, popped up. Um, maybe that tendon was wearing over the course of time, and then something was enough to really set it off. So maybe it was more reactive um, kind of tendinopathy slash uh, tear that occurred. Um, generally speaking, the majority of cuff pathology I see is more wear and tear. It's nagging. It kind of pops up here and there. Um, the majority of these seem to be more acute, which is definitely going to play a role. Uh, we know that acute rotator cuff tears do well from a surgical perspective. Uh, the more chronic ones, it's a little more complicated. Uh, and in the study, they actually had a supplemental video of an acute cuff tear from anterior subluxation and a snatch. So a person just caught a snatch with their arm too far behind their body. Uh, they had a subluxation. I think that's what tore the cuff, right? So these folks had to have a cuff tear from a CrossFit-related injury. And what you'll find in this study is that there was a lot of biceps tendon involvement too. We'll talk about that later. Um, the uh, type of cuff tears they had, it had to be at least a partial thickness tear grady, greater than 50%, which to be honest, um, a lot of surgeons don't recommend doing surgery on partial thickness tears. And generally, the smaller the tear, the better the outcome from, from the, uh, the surgery. Uh, so that's going to weigh into um, whether or not you think that rotator cuff tears are going to be really beneficial for these folks. Uh, they had to either have a partial thickness above 50%, a full thickness tendon tear, um, and then a lot of folks, like I said before, had a biceps injury as well. Um, these surgeries were all done by the same surgeon over a four-year basis. And then at the 24-month follow-up, they had an MRI and ultrasound follow-up to see if the tendon was still intact, basically. There were 20 males and two females, so not a whole lot of females. The surgery was going to be a cuff repair, uh, and it's mostly infraspinatus and supraspinatus, although there was some subscap and some different combination of tears. Uh, the biceps tendon was involved a lot. 
Um, and then in some folks, if they had AC joint pain, they also did a chromioplasty. They did a Mumford procedure. It was basically they, they take off the end of your, your clavicle. In terms of exclusion criteria, uh, folks that had glenohumeral osteoarthritis were included, and folks had concomitant conditions that would preclude CrossFit. I'm guessing if you have a major, let's say, low back injury or hip injury, and you can't get back to snatching, they're not going to keep you in the study because it's going to skew the results. So what was pain like before the surgery? And if you look at the, their VS, VAS, the average pain was a 7 out of 10. That's quite a bit. So these folks were, were pretty painful prior to surgery. Uh, and if you look at some of the other outcome measures, there's a constant score and there's an ASES score. And those were about 70, uh, 71, which is not terrible. But again, in very, very athletic folks, a lot of these outcome measures are not capturing their true pain and limitation because they can put a cup into the top cabinet, they can put on a jacket, uh, but they can't snatch, right? And that's the reason why they're getting a surgery. So a very, very high pain, but their function was actually not too bad. So in terms of diagnosis, what were these folks diagnosed with prior to getting a surgery? So there were a few slap tears, uh, looks like 17%. Um, a lot of these folks had some severe biceps inflammation, 30%. 8% um, actually had a complete biceps tear. Um, in terms of subscap tears, looks like 21%. In terms of bias, or bursitis, 70% had that. Uh, isolated supraspinatus tears, 30%. Supraspinatus and infraspinatus tears, 26%. Supra and subscap scare, excuse me, tears, 21%. And then also having AC spurs, 17%. Uh, in terms of the surgeries, there was a bunch of tenotomies and tenodesis, the biceps, 56% of those folks. Um, there was, I don't want to go over all of these too much. Um, in terms of cuff repairs, it looks like anterior superior cuff repairs, 42%. Posterior superior cuff repairs, 56%. Anterior acromioplasty, 79%. Now, if you're not viewing this on YouTube, this isn't going to make a ton of sense. I'm just rambling a bunch of uh, numbers at you. Uh, but if you want and you're listening to the podcast, uh, just go into the show notes, take a look at the uh, article. And if uh, you want to just check the YouTube channel, I have an image of this here so you can see the exact um, diagnosis and, and the surgeries. So methods. Uh, so after someone had this surgery, they were stuck in a sling somewhere between three and four weeks. And that was going to depend on the cuff tear size. Big old cuff tear, then closer to four weeks. Small cuff tear, closer to three weeks. They're kept in neutral rotation, 20 degrees of abduction. In the first three to four weeks, there was no physical therapy. People were just instructed to take the sling off for pendulums and elbow motion. Um, now in terms of physical therapy, what I've seen for a cuff um, PT. I think this is a little late to start physical therapy. I like to get some more range of motion in early on, uh, potentially try to ward off some of the atrophy and some of the muscles around the shoulder joint. It's a little late in terms of starting. And then the PT started after sling removal. So at the earliest, it was going to be at three weeks and then latest four weeks. And PT was done three times a week for one hour. Pretty, pretty typical there, right? So what else do we do with rehab? Weeks four to eight, they initiated passive range of motion. They kept the VAS below a five out of 10. So I'm guessing if they were more painful than a five out of 10, they wouldn't push that hard, right? They also had different modalities for pain relief. At this point, they allowed constant intensity jogging, treadmill, and cycling, which I thought was pretty cool because that's a question I often have. Can I do some running with my post-op rotator cuffs? In this study, they did it at four weeks and it seems like they did well, right? And then in the study, it said it, they progressed to interval work and eventually progressed to assault bike and rower work, but they didn't really say when, which I would have loved to have heard about just because I want to know when I can put my uh, rotator cuff patients on the assault bike or the rower. And then at week five, specifically, they started active range of motion. So it seems like week, let's say three to four, they were doing more passive and they progressed towards active around week five. Um, at this point, they also included more modalities like e-stim. They did a massage work. And this was interesting. Uh, they allowed their uh, patients to perform the Olympic lifts, the power lifts, with a PVC pipe supervised by a CrossFit coach. Uh, and to be honest, at, at week five, for most folks after a cuff repair, uh, probably not going to tolerate performing a snatch or an overhead squat with a PVC. So I thought that was pretty quick, but it was interesting uh, that they were allowed to get back to these movements as quick as they were allowed to. So... At month four, they started incorporating six scapula movements. So the original paper by Burkhart in 2003, they kind of have these progressive scapular movements, which you can check out this article online if you'd like to. 
Um, my thought on this is that probably a little late to incorporate these at month four, probably could have started these a whole lot earlier, especially when you start those active range of motion drills, right? Also the relevance, I'm not sure. I think oftentimes we, you know, first and foremost, we're not sure how important scapular dyskinesis, dyskinesis is for individuals. Uh, the other part is six scapula, I think is most common in throwers and overhead athletes. Now, an Olympic weightlifter or CrossFit athlete is not a baseball player, and I think that too often we're trying to treat these folks like baseball players. So I'm kind of curious as to why they included these six scapular movements in there. At month four, they also allowed weights to be used. Uh, it was a little weird. They said they started with 10% of body weight. Um, I don't know why they started with 10%. I'd also like to know more about what movements they used. Um, and also, they didn't really give a whole lot of information about progressive resistance exercise. When were you allowed to perform strengthening? And what did the strength work look like, right? I'm guessing that was probably up to the physical therapist and what they wanted to do. But I would have really liked some more information about what this looked like. Now, uh, the athletes were, were not allowed to do gymnastics until month six, right? Now, that's I don't know if I really like that um, just because there's all different gymnastics movements, right? Um, doing a pull-up is doing is a little bit different than a handstand push-up. Kipping is a little different than strict. Obviously, a muscle-up is more advanced than regular kipping. Would have loved to see when they started those, and I think in the future it's probably uh, best if we come up with a plan that incorporates lower-level gymnastics first and then higher-level ones over the course of time. I don't know if there's any one point, like the six-month mark, where you can unleash the floodgates and all of a sudden it's okay to do everything, right? So what were the results? How did this surgery do? So this is pretty cool. And, and these were the results at 24-month follow-up. So if you look at the VAS score, right, we talked about it. It was pretty intense. It was a 7 out of 10 to start. At 20 more, excuse me, 24-month follow-up, two years out, they are at a 0.8. So less than a one out of 10, and at least in my mind, that's really good. They still felt the shoulder, but it was way, way, way better, okay? And those outcome measures improved quite a bit as well. They went from 70 to 90-ish, um, so big improvement from that perspective. But again, um, we didn't expect to see a crazy improvement just because these folks were, were pretty functional beforehand. They just couldn't do CrossFit, right? So how about actually returning to CrossFit? So as you remember, they spent about 15 hours per week in the gym prior to CrossFit. After they had the operation, they were spending 15 hours per week. So there wasn't a significant difference in the time before and after surgery. These folks were still doing the same amount of CrossFit. The amount of time CrossFit was discontinued prior to surgery was 45 days on average. So like I said, these are probably mostly acute injuries. They weren't really stopping physical therapy or excuse me, stopping CrossFit for that long before they started that surgery. The length of time to resume CrossFit after surgery, the average was 8.7 months, right? So about nine months to get back to CrossFit for most folks. And this is what's really cool. How, um, when they returned back to CrossFit, at what level were they returning back to? And about 59% uh, said they returned at a higher level than they were at prior to the injury, right? About 32% said they returned at the same level um, than prior to the injury. And only two athletes or 9% said they were a lower level of fitness. Uh, now, this is really, really cool because when you have a surgery, oftentimes they say the surgery was a success. Well, what does that mean? Did you get your pain levels down, right? Did you get your function back? How much did you get back? And it looks like about 91% of the folks that had the rotator cuff repair returned at or higher than the level they were at prior to the injury, which is pretty darn good. And only two of those individuals were at a level lower, right? And we'll talk about those folks a little bit later. In terms of which movements were toughest to get back to, uh, for most folks, it was a snatch. So around 50% of folks, the last exercise to get back to was a snatch. Uh, for about a third of the athletes, they said that muscle-ups was that toughest exercise to get back. And then two athletes said the rope climb was tough. And then there were some other exercises. They just didn't list what those were. Uh, but this is pretty similar to what I see. Obviously, the snatch and the muscle up just takes extreme range of motion, a lot of strength and preparation, and um, it's going to take longer. But it's kind of nice to see that just because you can tell your your athletes that, yeah, you'll get back to CrossFit in some regard, but these are the movements you're probably going to have the most trouble with. This is what most athletes have trouble with. The other thing they're looking at is how many push-ups and pull-ups could you do? 
after the surgery. Uh, and this is just a testimony or testament to how good a shape these folks were in, right? Because after surgery, the average person was doing 40 plus or minus 15 reps. And this is men and women, keep in mind. And they were doing 11 plus or minus uh, reps of strict pull-ups as well. So pretty strong folks. Now, uh, they also looked at imaging at 24 months. Now, this I thought was really cool just because we know that in rotator cuff repairs, there's going to be a percentage of these folks where the, the cuff tendon retears, right? So I want to see what was going on in these individuals. And the other part is like, okay, well, if I get my cuff uh, repaired and I continue doing some of the activities that maybe cause problems, will I retear as a result, right? Uh, so they took people... Two months, or excuse me, two years later, and they did uh, ultrasound. And if they found that it was incomplete healing, they did an MRI afterwards, right, to see what was actually actually going on with those um, non fully healed tendons. And what they found in around 80% of the rotator cuff tendons, there was complete healing, right? But in 20% of the rotator cuffs, there was incomplete healing, right? What's always interesting, and, and this is the same for this study, is that even the folks that have a failure of healing, so it's incomplete healers, usually they're still feeling pretty good despite having a cuff that's retorn, right? So two out of five of those shoulders with incomplete healing, they get back to this, they got back to the same level of performance prior to the injury, right? So despite having a, a, a partial tear, incomplete healing of the tendon, they're getting back at the same level. And then three out of five of those athletes returned at a lower level of performance than prior to injury. So, you know, for the tens that didn't fully heal, um, a, a, a percentage of those are not getting back to the level we'd like to see. So if the ten does retear, that's probably an issue, right? We just don't know if that if it was CrossFit that caused these tendons to have incomplete healing uh, or if it was just time and, you know, a percentage of these are naturally going to retear, right? We just don't know that. So discussion and clinical commentary. Uh, at nine months follow-up, 100% of these folks returned to CrossFit. And I thought that was phenomenal. 91% of those returned at the same level or higher and the same exact time involvement. So doing a rotator cuff repair uh, for a competitive CrossFit athlete is going to get you back you know, to CrossFit for sure, um, based on this study anyway. And then also the large majority of those folks are going to get back at the same level or even higher right? Um, also, you know, this makes sense that it's going to take longer for some movements to get back to. The snatch and the muscle up took longer to come back. And I think it's a very hopeful message for folks. Uh, I personally, after reading this study, am less fearful of recommending surgery, right? Uh, but you do have to just keep in mind that these are probably acute tears, and it's going to be a little different than the average person that comes to see you with a degenerative cuff tear. So uh, we do know that acute tears do well with surgery. The acute tears have a good outcome. Um, so again, I just would be really curious if they would do another study on more degenerative cuff tears and see if these outcomes were the same, right? The other piece is that they used partial thickness tears in this study. Now, a lot of surgeons don't like doing rotator cuff repair on partial tendons, right? Um, and we do know that the smaller the tear, the better the outcome. So these larger tears, these massive tears, tend not to have as good outcomes as these partial tears, right? So maybe the data is a little skewed uh, just because these are smaller tears. You know, for the majority of folks I see that are considering surgery, they probably have a full thickness tear. Would there be a difference if all of these individuals had a full thickness? I don't know, right? Um, and the other piece is that they had kind of a shorter follow-up, right? I mean, two years is pretty good. Don't get me wrong. I'd like to see that uh, research done uh, two years later. Uh, I just would love to see five years, 10 years, 15 years later, um, are these tears uh, occurring again because we're doing more CrossFit, right? And the other thing that'd be interesting to see is that are we getting more osteoarthritis over the course of time? Uh, we do know in certain pathologies like meniscus tears, if we do something like a meniscectomy, we create more osteoarthritis over the course of time. If we do a rotator cuff repair, do we see the same thing, right? And this study didn't do that, but uh, it would be phenomenal to follow up with these guys in five years, 10 years, and see if they're kind of wearing at the same rate as other folks that have a rotator cuff repair but are not doing CrossFit. Uh, lastly, what I'd love to see is physical therapy versus surgery, right? So these partial thickness tears especially. Um, should we be doing surgery or should we be doing physical therapy? And in my mind, what I'd like to see is that if you have a partial tear and we do physical therapy, is that going to be better than if you have a partial tear and if you do surgery? 
And the other thing I think is really important is that five, 10 years down the line, if we repair it, is that going to have a better outcome as opposed to if we just do physical therapy? Do those partial 10 tears that we treat conservatively without surgery, do they worsen, worsen, worsen over the course of time, right? We'd love to see those long-term outcomes. And the other thing is that these were pretty high level athletes, right? Maybe they're not regional or games level athletes, but they were doing 15 plus hours per week. The other thing is that there were some individuals in the study, they were taking steroids, right? So generally speaking, if you're just a recreational athlete, you're probably not taking steroids in order to get a performance benefit, right? So at least in my mind, these guys didn't seem like the weekend warriors. It didn't seem like the recreational folks. Um, I would love to see a study in more recreational individuals to see if the, uh, the results are the same. That being said, I can't imagine that this, the results would be any worse, right? I imagine if someone is going to be a little bit more moderate in terms of their exercise, it's probably going to be a little bit better for that shoulder. Uh, that being said, for folks that are very competitive, they're often very, very good about doing their rehab, right? Uh, for folks that are not quite as competitive, more recreational, maybe they're busy, they have a family, they don't have the ability to devote 15 hours per week towards recreation, then they may not have the best outcome just because they're not willing to put in the work. But who knows, right? I don't have that information for you, but I'd love to see that in the future, right? So that's it for now, guys. I hope this article gave you some more insight for your patients so you can help them figure out whether or not they need to go into for uh, rotator cuff surgery. And lastly, I just want to give you a big thank you for your support. You do truly allow me to do what I love for a living. Believe it or not, I enjoy hanging out in my office right here and talking and presenting and hopefully helping other clinicians and coaches. If you're watching this on YouTube, please give me a thumbs up and please subscribe. If you're listening to this via podcast, leave me a positive rating and review. It helps me a ton, helps me grow, helps me continue to create these in the future. Okay. And lastly, if you want to go that last extra step to support me, Head to fitnesspainfree.com, click on the programs, and sign up for Fitness Pain Free Insider's online library. I'll put a link in the show notes. It's just a freaking dollar, okay, and then $12.99 a month in the future. If you subscribe, it allows me to continue doing this in the future, right? It takes a lot of time and effort to put these together. Uh, so if I can get some support, then it helps me continue, all right? Well, thank you very much, guys. Again, I appreciate it. Thanks again, and I'll see you on the next one.